not a con. Before I do anything, uh, I want to read something that I, uh, I wrote. <clears throat> Somewhere, perhaps in the United Arab Emirates, Iran, and or Malaysia, there are technical computer specialists working towards mastery of the global information infrastructure. Perhaps instead of a few selected people, teams are being assembled to operate in a distributed, geographically dispersed manner that slowly progress their individual skills, aptitudes, and agendas. Their goals are in their own minds very simple. To bring down high value targets that represent Western power and so-called Western aggression over Muslims, or some other repressed peoples throughout the third world nations. Perhaps this target will be a regional power grid or the stock exchange. Anything that relies on computer network infrastructures for their continued operation and facilitates the economic and military might of Western powers. They have a they have worked very hard to build cyber task forces that share their knowledge, focuses their respective efforts, coordinates the execution of its members' plans. Throughout this progression, each individual in their various cells or groups or organizations um, are responsible for a whole host of uh, technical skills. Throughout this progression, maintenance of the dissemination of their respective group's activities, accomplishments, recruitment, and training materials. <clears throat> Excuse me. These individuals are responsible for training the devoted as to how to transport and communicate the group's data and information in a secure manner. Acquire details on high value targets from both without and within their secured networks. Assemble dossiers for its leadership's review and devise attacks that will maximize fear and panic in the enemy's citizens in order to undermine so called free societies. Now, this very well could be fiction. The problem is, it isn't. Is it rampant? No. Have we had a cyber terrorist attack? Some like to argue, I think it was Kevin Mitnick that said or suggested that the power outage that happened on the eastern seaboard was a cyber terrorist attack. Maybe, maybe not. But I can tell you that when you're dealing with a global infrastructure that allows access from anywhere in the world to any other networked component, and you have a competitive global environment, cyber terrorism is coming. Now, I envision, based on that little scenario, that governments are going to mobilize, and they have. Do they have the technical skills to combat cyber terrorism? I think everybody in this room understands the answer is no. They can record them, log them, pursue some of them. But if you're very skilled at this whole hacking aspect, there are lots of ways to elude. Imagine this. You're living in Romania, or maybe the Philippines, and you want to attack the power plant over on Three Mile Island. Well, you can. 
You can penetrate their systems, monitor their emails, communications, etc. Attacking doesn't mean you're going to blow it up right now. Attacking also involves intelligence, surveillance, and assembly of information as a potential target. That's what this talk today is going to be about. Now, my style is very, very simple. One, I'm very loud if you can't tell. I, li I like to use my lungs, OK? I want to keep you guys awake, too. Because, hey, let's face it, caffeine only goes so far. Two, if you have something to bring to the table, please speak up. Stop me. Go, whoa, Andrew, stop. Whoa, whoa. Because I'll just keep going. I get all fired up, and that's it, you know? So please, raise your hand. Stop me. You want to bring something to the table. This isn't me expounding wisdom. This is us having a dialogue, OK? This is an awareness creation process, if, if you will. Now, here's today's agenda for the next hour. I'm going to talk about the definition of cyber terrorism. Now, that, that sounds like I'm an academic, right? However, the law uses definitions. And that will impact everything this community does with electronics, computers, networks, and so forth. So if you don't talk about the definition, how do you know what it is you're going to create to, uh, as far as laws and initiatives and keep within the scope of the initiative? I'm going to talk about the use of cyberspace by terrorists. Okay, I'm going to show you some diagrams, some other reports, and so forth. Reported cases. Now, reported cases doesn't mean prosecutions. It means what we have been given in the public domain, the unclassified stuff. Here are some things they have found. Then I want to talk about electronic laws that are going to govern computer crime. Because part of that is also the Patriot Act. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Patriot Act. There's other people who will spend two, three hours going through it. But it's currently being redebated for renewal and what provisions should or shouldn't become permanent. And if you're not part of the conversation, it happens without you. Then I'm going to talk about recent group prosecutions. And there are some pretty silly ones out there, but I'm going to bring those up. Some final thoughts on my part, some conclusions, insights, whatever, and then questions and discussions. Okay, and again, please feel free to stop me and participate. The Center for Strategic and International Studies put out this definition. Cyber terrorism means premeditated, wasn't an accident, politically motivated, all right, which means you're trying to affect something on a political level, by subnational groups or clandestine agents. Maybe they work for other governments. Maybe you have a subgroup a political party, a terrorist cell, whatever, or individuals, and this is the part that I kind of disagree with, against information and computer systems, computer programs, and data that result in violence against non-combatant targets. You have information warfare, you have cyber terrorism. Information warfare is against warfare combatants and their systems and infrastructure. Cyber terrorism is the civil side of it. Okay, That's an important distinction because people blur them together. Individuals. That means by this definition, if you intended to eavesdrop on certain wireless communications going on during this convention, you might be a cyber terrorist. 
Well, that's pretty harsh. Another definition. Now, this one comes from the FBI during testimony. Deputy Assistant Director of the Cyber Division of the FBI. And he says, a criminal act. So you're a cyber terrorist if you commit a criminal act perpetrated by the use of computers and telecommunication capabilities. Now think about that. How much of our infrastructure, our daily lives, use computers and telecommunications? Resulting in violence, destruction, and or, now this is important, and or disruption of services. So if you disrupt services, you're a cyber terrorist where the intended purpose is to create fear by causing confusion. There's a lot of confused people out there. Computer users are, compu are confused every day. And uncertainty within a given population with the goal of influencing a government or population to conform to a particular political, social, or ideological agenda. What happened to hacktivism? Social sit-ins, cyber sit-ins. You could spam people and say, look, we need to get rid of this particular government people. And you're asserting, through the use of technology, your political ideology. You're a cyber terrorist. Okay? This is, now, we don't have any laws yet on cyber terrorism, but it's being worked on. And the opportunity, once one major occurrence happens, you will see, just like the Patriot Act, all of this stuff assembled and put into a law. So keep that in mind. And by the way, I'm not afraid to kind of upset a few people in my government because they're my government. Like I said, you have to be part of the dialogue to complain about it. Now, this is my definition. And, and I may not be right. It's an emerging domain. Cyber terrorism is a premeditated, it's important that you plan this out. You decided to do this. Politically motivated, criminal act, you have to violate some law by subnational groups, or agents against information, computer systems, programs, data. Here's the important part, that result in violence, where the intended purpose is to create fear in non-combatants. Violence, not necessarily you scare someone, OK? That's an important distinction. I get some emails and man, I, I'm, I'm terrified to read them. I get emails and after I've read them, I'm pretty sorry that I spent the time reading them. But you should see, you know, some of the content that we are exposed to or we expose other people to. So, but this is my definition. Still work in process. Instead of violence, maybe it should be physical violence, such as changing the blood type in your medical database before you have surgery. Now, you're dead on the table. Think about that. Does that mean the East Coast blackout wasn't violent? Wasn't violent? Um, if it was, if, because they're not saying, they, they say it wasn't, but I've learned that years later we find out, you know, if it was, it would have had to go through a multitude of systems. It would have had to uh, operate in what they call SCADA systems. Yeah, but it's not violence. Well, <laughs> you know, I got, I got to give New York City kudos because I expected them to go crazy. And they were like, hey, you know, the food's going to spoil. Let's have a block party. <laughs> okay? 
Now, if that, if that didn't result in violence, had there been massive riots and thieves and looting, that might have resulted in violence. So, but if that was a malicious act, it wouldn't have been considered cyber terrorism just because the result wasn't the desired effect. It depends. For instance, hospital patients that are on respirators, there's a physical effect when their backup power generators run out of fuel. Yeah, but in this case, that would have been a coincidental after, that would have been a coincidental side effect. The target of that, if that wasn't event, the target of that would have been, haha, black out the East Coast. Now, I'm not. It wasn't, it wasn't just, you know, black out hospitals. I, I agree in principle. However, I'm no lawyer, but if you're the driver of the car of the guy who shot somebody, you committed murder. And that's, that's kind of how the legal process works. To my understanding, they're going to go after you for murder, even though you're not the one that shot the person. So why did they take it for granted that it was a premeditated act and somebody died that would probably be negligent? They'd still be guilty of something not exactly murder, but negligent, uh, you know, whatever else they come up with. You get in trouble. There is a case, in, in, in the law books, I mean, there is a case of a felony murder where you know, if somebody dies as a result of a felony that you've committed, then you are guilty of, you know, they basically consider you to have murdered that person whether or not during the commission of your felony you intended to hurt them at all. Right, so your actions indirectly caused violence, therefore you committed the violence. It's an associative property. Creating definitions, though, violence is an awfully loose word. Because there, there is violence against property. I mean, Vandalism is considered violence against property. Okay, now let me point one thing out, okay, just to kind of level it out. Terrorism, forget the cyber. Terrorism is about creating fear. All right, cyber terrorism is the use of cyberspace and all the other infrastructure to create or facilitate fear, ultimately. How you might apply it in a legal environment, you need some kind of a threshold when it comes to violence. And that would get, again, I have a general definition. It's not, you know, set in stone. And every time you say, you know, every time you print something, everyone has an opinion. So, and I'm not, I'm not being offensive, okay? So I throw this out as a working definition. Yes, sir? Why, why bother redefining terrorism? I mean, the second half of that is redefining terrorism. Why not do the sort of oh, accepted definition of terrorism and just tag on the cyber part? <coughs> well, if you take a look at some of the laws that are being passed around the world as for a, an, a, what the law calls terrorism, I think we could spend two hours going through those. Every government has their own perspective and agenda in passing their legislation. This is, I'm giving you this definition so you know where I'm coming from for the rest of the talk. Maybe that's the way I should present that. Um, I'm not redefining terrorism. I'm defining cyber terrorism, which is different. That's, and, and if there isn't a distinction, then I throw a hand grenade into a church, I'm committing the same act as if I hack into somebody's network and send them a message that scares them. Yes, sir? Um, you're saying violence that creates fear, basically, here, the definition of terrorism. Um, for example, if, I, if you do turn the power off, um, we're creating fear, correct? Yes. Okay. But we haven't created violence. We haven't created violence. The violence and fear seems kind of different here. But something that results in fear might be something different that results in violence. Like if, uh, as a, a computer specialist, I could say, hey, look, there's this vulnerability to Microsoft's uh, application here. Um, and I create tons of fear or throughout the entire world just by, by publicizing that. Would that be a terrorist act according to this? Though? No, because there's no violence involved. Well, if we don't write the statutes right, it might be. Yeah. And this is what I'm trying to point out. If you don't. If you don't, now, don't even use my definition. Maybe we need to even 
cut out the notion of cyber terrorism, just say use of computers to facilitate terror. The problem is the larger the net you, you make, the bigger the catch. So when we go fishing, we catch dolphins with our tuna. Big net. Well, acceptable losses? That's for the population to decide. Now, cyberspace usage by terrorists. Network structures, which is more than just computers, allows terrorists to operate in distributed cells over greater geographic coverage areas, and they can maintain an identity without a physical location. Now let, let's put this into this country's terrorist background, say the Ku Klux Klan, right after the Civil War. I'm not going to speak for what they do or don't do now, but back then, imagine if they didn't have a meeting place, if they could have groups of five people scattered all over the country, could coordinate their activities, and only one small cell would get caught periodically, what the state of fear would have been back then. Well, this is what the network environment allows, is small groups over geographic area globally, and they're able to be mobile and still maintain a web presence. And I'm going to give some examples. These are the three main things that I feel cyber terrorism's contribution to terrorism is. Communication, coordination, and information sharing. Using voice over IP, email and news groups, file transfers, chat sessions, websites, and any other emerging technology that's coming out. There are games out there where you get to be in some desert storm kind of a thing, and if you want to be the Iraqis, you can, and you can have conversations. Yeah, I think we need to blow up this, and we need to kill that, and we need to shoot. What if it's not a gamer? Now, that, that sounds bizarre. Why should we be doubting what's being done? How do you monitor that stuff? You really can't because it's actually in a proper context. Here's a little diagram for you. At the bottom, or I'd say, let, let me put it in the middle. Let's imagine each of these is a cell. And they're communicating via laptops and desktops and uh, programmable phones and pagers and PDAs and so forth using whatever local technology. So each cell talks to itself. The cells themselves may access a universal communications and information portal. Maybe it's a website, a news group, a whole host of stuff. And so somebody posts, um, you know, we don't like the new prime minister of so-and-so. And that signals these guys to think about how they could go after them out in the open. Or, you know, the, uh, the, this country invaded that country, so we need a new jihad. And all of you think about how you can help Muslims around the world or uh, narco-terrorists down in, in Chile and, and Colombia and et cetera. Okay? It's not restricted just to these guys living in the desert. So this is kind of up out in the open. This is what we see. Then each of the individual cells in various clusters may have a higher level of coordination. The lieutenants of Al Qaeda, perhaps. These guys operate at the command and control level. Maybe Osama, an aide. OK?
Now, according to the Anti-Terrorism Coalition's database of terrorist websites and e-groups, this is, there's a website out there, and that's what they do. They keep track of all these guys. There's over a thousand websites, e-groups, and forums that promote and disseminate terrorist activities. Training manuals, all kinds of stuff. No small matter. I must compliment these people because since they started posting this stuff, about three quarters of these sites have been taken down due to violation in your user agreement. And other countries have taken down the sites once they're aware of them. As hackers, keep that in mind as you're perusing things. Here's another little thing. Anybody want to debate if cyber terrorism exists or not, just look at all the beheadings. I have never witnessed a beheading live. And I have been all over the place. I've seen a lot of things. I've never seen one human being take a head off of another. Now I can. Do you really want to travel Spend your tourism dollars or start a business in a country where this occurs. If that isn't affecting political and economic change, I don't know what, what other, regardless of the definitions, this has an impact. And by the way, I'm, I'm not advising, but I will suggest that you go take a look at part or all of one of these beheadings. Because these are the type of people you're dealing with. I'm not pro or anti-war or any of this sort of thing. I'm telling you, though, you better understand the enemy. Because these guys don't care. The posting of the video itself, you might argue, is a criminal act, although it depicts a criminal act, right? Well, now, that's a, that's a very valid point. If I obtain, if I'm a news journalist, or even an, an individual, and I obtain a video, somebody sends it to me anonymously, and I post it, all right, now maybe I would be immoral for it, maybe I would be uh, lecherous, because I'm going to somehow profit from it, or, or I could be viewed as sympathetic. It depends on what the intent is, but setting that aside, Posting it doesn't make me a criminal. How I acquired it might. Conspiracy, being associated, being a supporter. Now, there's been no successful prosecutions in this arena because websites can be created with no face-to-face no -face identity. So this is a big thing. But... These guys are getting the message out. Don't mess with us. Don't come to Iraq and rebuild a country. Don't come to this part of the world because you'll show up on TV and the whole world will know. We got the better of you. So, not a fun place. Now, imagine if you're law enforcement. Now, I have to say, law enforcement does an exemplary job for a large part of what they do. They have finite number of people, finite number of resources over large geographic areas with a whole range of technical issues that they encounter. Okay, So I'm not anti-law enforcement. But they're not prepared to deal with this. You remember this guy? Let me step aside while you shoot dart guns and other things at them. Anybody think that these guys are all camel jockeys really needs to reassess their capabilities. The majority of Al-Qaeda leadership came from middle class, from large cities. 
They're neither ignorant nor stupid. Many of them have Western degrees. Okay? And they have scientists and computer experts, and they are recruiting more. Here's some reported cases of their uses. Now, I'm only using what, what, what I have been able to find as reported. I have no, no direct uh, confirmed authority from law enforcement on this. Encrypted details for destroying the airliners were on Ramzi Youssef's laptop computer. Osama bin Laden's aides used email to transmit the instructions for the September 11th attacks. SCADA systems, supervisory control and data acquisition. And this, by the way, is one area that a lot of the experts agree falls into the domain of cyber terrorism. Hoover Dam was hacked into once upon a time by a hacker, some kid. Imagine if you could actually open up the floodgates and leave them open. What would happen to Las Vegas? Okay. Or let's hack into the um, the uh, transportation system for all the lights in a city. And turn you've seen this like in Gremlins and so forth movies. They're all green. These are simple electronic systems. And when they are set up so you can remotely change them, they're vulnerable. Um, Al-Qaeda has owned computers with structural and engineering data associated with dams. I'm not going to attempt to say this gentleman's name. I'm really, really bad with names. Um, However, this guy is known for using social engineering <clears throat> in order to gain access to military networks. Usernames, passwords, recruits, so forth. My understanding is this fella, through some chat sessions, talked to two hackers, one from Florida, one from Canada, who had just hacked into, um, I think it was the White House or the State Department. And that may be considered cyber terrorism now. I think people are trying to push it. The kids didn't know who this guy was. They were just sharing that, hey, they had a success, and here's how you do it, and so forth. Al Qaeda prisoners, when interrogated, freely state their intentions to use computer systems and tools to further their goals. A couple years ago, a company called Riptech, which was later bought by Symantec, and suddenly their reports changed. So I'm not showing you Symantec's reports. Okay, the data, I don't, there's something about the data. I don't, I don't like it, so I'm not presenting it. <laughs> Go figure. Um, in any event, Riptech in two quarters, half the year in 2002, reported the number of attacks per company by industry. This is important, by industry. The number one industry attacked, power and energy. Now, guys, are you going to attack the thing that powers your computers to allow you to play? So where are these attacks coming from? Aren't you all evil hackers? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't turn the camera over that way. Um, so, I mean, but look at this. 1,300 attacks per company in the power and energy sector for half the year. The number two is financial services. Now, everyone in this room can understand hacking into a bank, transferring some funds. You know, this is nice fiction. 
I hope it's fiction. Um, high tech, maybe we've got industrial espionage going on. Okay, I can see that. Nonprofit. Yes, sir. The attacks, for the most part, were simple penetration attempts. However, right after we went into Iraq, or before we went into Iraq, it was about 54%, I believe, was the reporting number of reporting companies that said they had one or, or more serious attacks from these attacks. In other words, they actually got in and did something bad. It went from 54 or 52% to almost 70% right after we attacked Iraq. Okay? And by the way, a lot of these countries that you wouldn't think are hardwired to the internet, Iran, Chile, Vietnam, United Emirate, Air, uh, uh, Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, they are heavily wired per capita. Per their population, they got a lot of connections. And they use them. All right. Now, this is the part that probably going to end up mixing a few things up. <laughs> Electronic law. Most of the law governing computer crime is based on fraud. It's, it's computer fraud. And you've got one, two, three, four, four primary, and there's others. I'm not going to cover all of them. And the Patriot Act. Now, the first one, and I actually, you know, I cut and paste. Title 18, Part 1, Chapter 47, 1030. Fraud and related activity in connection with computers. Use a computer to commit fraud, we're going to arrest you. That kind of thing. Now, this is important. Having knowingly accessed a computer without authorization or exceeding authorized access. Now, you guys are technical savvy. Doesn't take much. Um, or obtained information. If you obtain information, an executive order may be issued by the president for reasons of national defense or foreign relations. The internet is all about foreign relations. It allows us to share our culture, knowledge, position, ideas, etc. The president, through an executive order, can deem a whole host of things as computer fraud. Um, let's see. To the advantage of any foreign na nation willfully communicates, delivers, transmits, or causes to be communicated, delivered, or transmitted, or attempts to communicate, Deliver, transmit, or, com or what is that? Causes. Causes. Yeah, it's cut off. No. To be, no? <laughs> hey, I don't know. Here we go. Yeah, or cause. To be communicated, delivered, or transmitted the same to any person not entitled to receive it. If you are in charge of a mail server, Watch out. <laughs> or willfully, now this is the part I love. This is the part I love. Or willfully retains the same and fails to deliver it to the officer or employee of the United States entitled to receive it. What do I do if I get an email that I shouldn't have got that was supposed to go to a government official? I, I delete. I don't leave me alone. Not according to this. 
If you're in receipt of it, you have a duty to do something about it. Title 18 goes on to basically handle financial or credit records, information from any U.S. agency or department, uh, information from any protected computer if the conduct involved an in interstate or foreign communication. More than five grand in damage, modification or impairment, basically affecting the medical industry, physical injury to any person, a threat to public health or safety. Well, I recall the Kevin Mitnick trial, and he was considered a threat to uh, public health and safety. Okay? Keep that in mind. Who decides? And with intent to extort. So there was actually a case where some Romanian hackers had been monitoring emails from the polar observation station, got the access, passwords, and other things, and then blackmailed, if you don't help us by giving us money, we're going to let the world have at your station. The computer they penetrated also controlled the life support in a, zero, a below zero environment. Okay, so blackmail happens. Whoops. Did I go too far? There we go. All right. Chapter 19, 119, interception and disclosure of wire, oral, or electronic communications are prohibited. Oral. oral. Like yes. <laughs> oral. If you're talking on the phone. If I have a wireless handset and you're monitoring it, that's an oral communication, as well as an electronic communication. All right. So I'm just pointing out what's in, in the law. I'm not, you know, I didn't write this stuff. Now, here's the part that you guys need to see. Intentionally intercepts, et cetera, et cetera. Intentionally uses, et cetera, et cetera. Intentionally discloses, and so forth. Well, there is no crime without intent. So if you're putting intent into the law, then you're making a distinction that you can commit a crime without intent. Think about that. Now this one's pretty straightforward. Chapter 121, unlawful access to stored communications. And now that we have digital phone networks, people can access voicemails and all kinds of things. Intentionally accesses without authorization a facility through which an electronic communication service is provided. An ISP sounds like that might apply. Intentionally exceeds an authorization to access that facility. So you subscribe to the ISP and then you bump up your security access rights. And thereby obtains, alters, prevents authorized access to a wire or electronic communication while it is in electronic storage in such system. So you hack into emails and delete them. Okay? But it's straightforward. You know what you can and can't do. It's not convoluted. Whoever helped write this, nice and simple. Now, what the courts decide to do with it is a separate issue. We're still just dealing with the law. Title 50. The president, through the attorney general, may authorize electronic surveillance without a court order. Hey, wait a minute. Isn't that what the Patriot Act was supposed to do? This law is already in existence. All 
now. Do you guys want? Yes, sir. I think the Patriot Act was more deal with domestic communications. And this is for national defense purposes. I mean, the foreign power. Right? Well, if you read parts of the Patriot Act and you listen to the arguments, I have a bad habit of recording the video archives. And I actually go back and I take a look at the arguments for certain things. Their argument was, we, we must be able to access electronic communications without a court order. That, that was the stovepiping argument. The, the national defense agencies already had those powers uh, via here. But it was the domestic agencies, the FBI, and so on and so forth, that are charged with maintaining domestic order that did not have that power yet. They want that ability. That's because the courts restricted it. OK. And so they, they added that. Now, one thing I must say with regards to this is that the Patriot Act allowed all these agencies to pursue people doing things overseas from the US. So if one of you guys want to go and break into something in Venezuela, well, the Patriot Act now gives them teeth. But Again, a lot of it, I'm just pointing out the law. What the court rulings are will determine its application. And then they produce more law. Now, the Patriot Act basically went through these other sections and a few others. 202 is about computer fraud, clarified, added more uh, um, <coughs> punishment lowered the threshold. 204 was about exemptions, which is certain communications were exempted from uh, surveillance law and other things. 202 was about life protection disclosure. If you don't disclose something and someone's life is at stake and then you disclose it, you could be sued. So basically, if the government says, you've got to reveal to me this guy's emails because his life's in danger or his brother's life is in danger, life protection is a reason for somebody to release your private information without liability. Delayed warrants. This is the part that's being debated now, is that they don't have to serve you a warrant to have one. They can give it to you later after they got what they wanted. OK? Section 216 adds pen trap orders for tracing internet and na network communications countrywide. So they can actually record everything that's going on remotely, wherever you go, wherever you access. Pen trap, a pen slash trap. Um, you've lived in an apartment complex, or you know people who have. There is a communication box with all the wires that lead then to all the apartments. They don't have to go into your apartment to tap your phone. They just have to go to that box or a junction box further down the line and put a trap, there, uh, uh, a uh, surveillance at that point. So they can record your communications at any point between your phone or internet connection, cable, all the way through. Correct. So applied to the internet would probably be like header information and stuff. Subject lines. Subject lines. Communication, so it's, it's less of a boundary thing. No, but they can trace your habits, your location, you know, where you tr where you go, basically who you call. And, but it's, just, it, it's not; it doesn't offer the same protection. It's communication. It's easier for them to get to. Correct. Uh, listen, if you're if you're sending, you know, encrypted something or another, they're not stealing that. 
what they're doing is they're figuring out who you sent it to and at what location and where you sent it from. And that gives them breadcrumbs to uh, pursue other avenues. Okay. Um, okay, some recent group prosecutions. 19 individuals were indicted in an internet carding conspiracy, the Shadow Crew Organization, which was called One Stop Online Marketplace for Identity Theft. Now, why is that important? Identity theft. <laughs> Imagine you have a false passport, or, or you have a false driver's license and credit card. Now, you can use someone else's identity to do certain things, make certain transactions, and it's not you, okay? I was at a presentation uh, about a month ago where Secret Service, you know, they presented the, uh, the Russian net has access to these identity theft rings. They ordered passports. They ordered a whole host of identity items, and they were really, really high quality. Keep that in mind. This, you know, we're getting scary now. Ramzi Youssef had another alternative identity. That's why he was able to get out of the country after the first uh, trade tower explosion. Oops. Nope. Going too fast. Go back. There we go. Uh, six internet fraudsters indicted in a conspiracy to steal more than 10 million from a technology distributor. A Louisiana man was prosecuted for reprogramming web TV to dial 911. Okay, so every time uh, you know, your, your web TV would just periodically call 911. Emergency squads would show up. Uh, Kazakhstan or as uh, Team America says, Durka Durkistan, um, sentenced, uh, they, uh, a hacker was sentenced to four years prison for breaking into the Bloomberg systems. That's our stock trading system. Okay, imagine that you could get a hold of that data or modify it, how you could impact our entire economy in a day. And there's others. Now, I want to point out there has not been one successful cyber terrorist conviction. There's been prosecution, but through appeals and all this other stuff, hasn't happened. So when I hear Richard Clark say, cyber terrorism, we must have new laws. We have a lot of laws. OK, use them. All right, my final thoughts. Cyber terrorism's emerging. It's not here yet. It's coming. It has a social political element. It's primarily a communication coordination and activity dissemination function right now. Electronic attacks will most likely be used for intelligence gathering or as a force multiplier. The flight over Pennsylvania was able to be averted because we had cell phones. We now have viruses affecting cell phones. So what would happen if we disabled a cellular network before an attack? How about all the rescue squads if they couldn't communicate with the hospitals? How many more people would have died who were injured? Because you, you didn't know who they were, where they were, or how to treat them. Existing laws give ample authority to arrest and prosecute someone for doing almost anything they shouldn't be with a computer. 
Like I said at the beginning, if you're not part of the dialogue, even if you're wrong, you're going to learn something. Participate. Write these guys. That's why we pay them. That's why we send them to Washington. Any questions? Well, okay, we'll start with you. I think criminal in the definition, and there's in a lot of definitions, is problematic um, because there, there can be some actions that are outside the definition of criminal. And then jurisdiction. You, you've, got this com you've got these countries like, like Afghanistan, which, you know, they're in transition. They're not, you know, they're not part of the international treaties yet. Like, is it a criminal act? Now, you, you're, all right, you're bringing into uh, the issue of globalized enforcement. Because what happens in America or U.S. or North or one of our treated countries may not be the source of the attack. In the Philippines, you remember the I Love You virus? Well, that kid, we didn't have a treaty. They arrested him. They didn't have any laws there. He didn't go to jail. He wasn't extradited. So the law is slow to catch up. And just creating law isn't going to work. You have to have purpose, not one big net and now we can have uh, the, the government police it. The government has to work with people. But yes? What good, do, what good do most of these laws do against international terrorists? You can't go after people in Russia. There, that's correct. So, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, power to demand. <laughs> now, look. <laughs> and that's bullshit. We should be number one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I admit that America is number one in certain areas. All right, and we strive to be number one that's in certain areas. McDonald's. That's bullshit. <laughs> Here's here, but you're you're bringing up the absolute point: is we're going to restrict our ability to self-test our own networks eliminate our latitude to maybe contribute. I mean, all these laws are nice, but they don't do shit to help take care of the rest of the world's problems. And nobody cares, because we're the target. You know? 20, here's the thing, though. 24% of internet subscribers reside in the US. Yeah, but 100% of the attacks I've ever seen on my company have come from outside the US. Yes. We barred Asia from even communicating with our network. A black hole, like, <laughs> we black hole, like, 50 class A's. And you know, we blocked off all of Asia. That's right. You know. And, but, but now you see, they're actually moving an agenda forward by doing that. They're polarizing. When you, here's the, here's the thing to think about, as system administrators and so forth. The internet allows us to share our culture our ideals, our approaches, our systems. That brings the world closer together. It creates a small faction who will polarize us and not like it, but it generally it creates more harmonious environment. The more these guys get to do what, what they're succeeding at, which is blocking that access, the less we can change what's going on out there. You can't police the world. You can't chase after these guys in China and Vietnam and so forth. Very, very difficult. Even with the treaties, how do you find them? Who did what? So this is, like I said, this whole notion of cyber terrorism, much less cyber crime, is going to be with us for a while. Now's the time to define what the initiatives are. Are we out of time yet? Okay, I'm dead. Thanks, everybody.